In this episode, we're going to talk about the greatest, 70 times 7 and the 70. Here we go. So we're going to start in this episode in Matthew 18. This is happening shortly after the experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. And here we find Jesus dispensing wisdom, dispensing uh, some of his teachings to the disciples. The disciples come to him and ask him, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I think it's hard to know exactly what they mean by that, so we can infer a few different things. One is they might be asking amongst themselves. We don't know that, though, I don't think. But we, they might be asking amongst themselves here, uh, who is the greatest amongst us? And who has the highest level of authority? And Jesus makes it very clear the way the hierarchical structure works in the kingdom of heaven. It's not necessarily the same way that it works here on earth. And he says to them that he who is the least among you, who is the most humble among you, is the greatest among you. And he gives the example of a little child. And he brings a little child amongst them and says, if you humble yourself as a little child, then that is what makes you the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I think that thinking about who humbled themselves the most, it would be, of course, himself, Jesus Christ. He definitely lowered himself, humbled himself more than any person who has ever lived or ever will live on the earth. And therefore, he is the greatest because he bore everybody else's burdens, because he humbled himself more than anybody else ever will. And that makes him the greatest. And so a, a poignant lesson here to the disciples and letting them know how that hierarchical structure works in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever is the most humble. And again, if we go back to understanding what humble means, this is my, my understanding, is that it, it, it does not mean that you are passive. It does not mean that you are weak. That is not humility. Jesus certainly was not passive and weak in Gethsemane or on the cross. Yes, he allowed everything to happen to him, but the point isn't that he allowed it to happen. The point is, is that he chose to let it happen. He did not have to do that. And he chose to humble himself by doing the will of the Father. In other words, doing what was right, what was required. And so we can humble ourselves by simply bowing to eternal principles and to the principles of the gospel, doing what is right, bowing to the Lord and his example and his teachings. That is humility. And you can be very strong at doing that. I don't think people would say that, you know, Captain Moroni, for example, was weak, but perhaps he was very humble in a number of ways. He bowed to certain principles and did what he felt he had to do to preserve the nation and to preserve the gospel being taught amongst his people and to preserve the people. So that's how the hierarchical structure works in the kingdom of heaven. And that's obviously a principle that we should all learn to bow to eternal principles and to the principles of the gospel. And then he follows that up with what I think is support for what he has just taught in becoming the most humble. And he says here in verse 7, as he has been speaking about children and becoming like children, he says, Woe unto the world because of offenses or sin, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. So what would giving something up that we really need, a hand, an arm, mean in principle? It means sacrifice, I think. It means giving something up. It means humbling ourselves and sacrificing 
that part of us that might hold us back from progressing and from getting into the kingdom of God. Obviously, if we humble ourselves to the principles of the gospel, that's going to require a great amount of sacrifice because we're not built and born in this world to be perfect. And so we're going to have to, figuratively speaking, leave a hand, leave an arm, leave sometimes very uh, difficult things for us to give up behind in order to be able to move forward. And then Jesus says something interesting in verse 11. And this is a message that he has given several times, but he, he words it a little bit differently here. He says, For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Which seems obvious, but aren't we supposed to be just like him? And aren't we supposed to be working on those that are lost? It's easy, I think. I've certainly fallen into this trap before to feel like you have your comfortable position in the church. You're in the club. And other people that are like you and have the same, uh, you, you, you've accepted a goal in mind that you have for your future and for your, your family. And perhaps there are others that are not as active uh, that don't accept that goal right now or don't live in a way to pursue that goal, that same goal. And it's easy to just stay with what's comfortable. But here Jesus is saying the reason he's here is for those that are lost. It's like the, the uh, parable of the prodigal son, right? And, and the father getting so excited about the son that was lost coming back or him sitting with Jesus sitting with the sinners and saying that the healthy do not need a physician. So the whole purpose of Jesus Christ is to help the sinners. And of course, that's all of us. Some of us might be a little bit more down that road, but his whole purpose is to save those that need saving. And I think the environment here of the Pharisees, Sadducees, the, the Jews in power is that they've excluded everybody else. And if you're not exactly like them, perhaps that fellowshipping isn't happening. That charity and love is not going across to those that are not following exactly what they're supposed to be doing, perhaps under, under the law of Moses. And so he gives the parable of the lost sheep. And here's how it goes in verse 12. How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Again, just like the prodigal son. So Jesus' mission is to go after the one. And of course, there's many more than one. We're all the one, aren't we? We're all lost. We're all fallen. We are all the one that is lost out in the mountains. And what a wonderful message to know that that's what his whole mission is, is to save us as individuals to save us which have strayed and have fallen. And then he delves right into, again, the spiritual economy that he loves to talk about. We hear him talk often about payment or debts or money. And he uses this example of the, the man-made economy to compare it to the spiritual economy, which is real. And exists. And this is how he does it. He says, he gives the parable of the man that came to the Lord who owed the Lord, his Lord, his master, a lot of money. And the servant begged him for forgiveness. And the master said, okay, you're, you're forgiven. And his large debt was forgiven because he came to him and begged for, him, for, for help. And then that same servant turned around and somebody owed him a smaller debt, but he would not forgive the debt of the person that owed him. And so Jesus says, look, understand that this is how it works. You're going to ask your heavenly father for a lot of forgiveness throughout your life. 
you have a massive debt that you have got to pay or that needs to be forgiven. And so if you go out and do not forgive others their debt, then you're going to have a hard time in the spiritual economy and you're going to have a hard time with the Father. And this is what he says. And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. If ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespass. So again, this is like the platinum rule instead of the golden rule. It is do unto others as you would have God do unto you. Because that's how this economy works. That's how this debt works. If you're going to ask for forgiveness from God, you're going to need to give forgiveness to others. And if you can't do that, if you can't forgive others their trespasses, then you're not going to be forgiven. And you're going to have to go through a lot because that, that forgiveness is, is not going to be there for you. So the spiritual economy here is, I receive payment really from the Savior by proxy, and I can be forgiven of my debt. And then I can turn and I need to forgive the debt of others as well by proxy. And so by sharing each other's burdens, by offering forgiveness, then everybody is made whole. But if I receive in the middle here, I receive that forgiveness and then I turn and I don't offer the forgiveness, then that forgiveness for those people is not given to them. They are not made whole and I am not made whole either. It's a two-way street. Forgiveness is a two-way street. And this discussion about the spiritual economy was triggered by a question that Peter had to Jesus. He says up in verse 21, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? So what if this ha keeps happening? How often do I forgive? And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven times. So in other words, as much as it takes... And if you think about it, as difficult as that would be, right? You don't want to be trampled on and you don't want to have to forgive a lot of different people. That's, that's a hard thing to do. I mean, that's, that's tiring. <laughs> it's tiring. It takes a lot out of you to forgive people. It really is difficult. Think about what the Lord had to do and has to do. He has to take that burden. He has to forgive everyone. And so he's saying, you're going to want forgiveness as many times as you need it. And it's going to be often. You need to turn around and offer forgiveness as many times as it's needed. 70 times 7. And so we go from the 70 times 7 in Matthew 18 to the 70 in Luke 10. And this is where the 70 are called. So just like we have the 70 in the church today, the 70 were called in the church, the early church, by Jesus Christ. Now, 70 is an interesting number, and this comes up a few different times. But back in the time of Moses, there were 70 that were called. They were brought together, and they were uh, put together as part of the priesthood. And they were able to come up to Mount Sinai up to a certain point, but not all the way. So they had a position in the hierarchical structure of the priesthood. Why 70? Well, possibly it is because there were 70 families that came from Noah. And so what this would represent is all of the families of the earth would be represented by the 70. And so you would have uh, the 12 that were over, you know, the 12 judges of Israel would be structured on top. You'd have 12 princes of the tribes. You have 12 apostles here with Jesus. And then you have the 70, which would be going out to everyone eventually. And that would make sense, right? It, the 70 have always been, had a focus 
uh, based in scripture on missionary work. And so they would be ones going out to the Gentiles, out to the world to preach the gospel. I remember when I was growing up, uh, there was a quorum of 70 in my ward. You know, everybody had a quorum uh, that was, I think, I think it might have been centered in the stake, but you would have, you know, the men would go to, the, the, the men would go to the elders quorum, they would go to the 70s, meet with the 70s, or they would go with the high priests. Now we've brought that all the way down to one here recently. But the 70s were all in charge of missionary work. And then they kind of rolled that up and made that uh, up into only up into the seven quorums of the 70, which are both the general authorities and the area 70. I think it's the first and second quorums of the 70 are the general authorities, and the other quorums of the 70 are area 70. But 70 is consistent with that. There were also 70 angels that a lot of uh, the religions in the ancient times would have, and they would have a, an angel, one of the 70 angels would be over each one of the peoples. And there were 70 or 72 or 71, uh, there's 70, 71, the Sanhedrin has 71. I don't know if it was always that way, maybe there were 70 or 72, but that 70, 71, 72, that number is very consistent as part of a hierarchical structure, both in the priesthood and in, in a secular manner, just like with the Sanhedrin. Those that went to Egypt from Jerusalem to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek, into the Septuagint, in the first or second century AD, more or less, second or third century AD, there were 70, I believe 70, 72 of them that went and did that. And again, it's going into Greek. It's going into the uh, Gentile language that would go out to everyone. That's why it's called the Septuagint. I mean, it's 70. And so the 70 go out and they preach and they perform miracles and they heal. And they say that even the devils are subject to them. These are all practices of the Melchizedek priesthood. Why? Because the Melchizedek priesthood is the priesthood of the Son of God, is the priesthood of Jehovah. It's the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And he gives the power over all of those things. And so they all come back to Jesus just overjoyed because all of, they are able to do all of these things in his name. And Jesus says to them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And I wonder if this was part of a vision that he had at his baptism. And he says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And so this is seems to be a, a clear allusion to Genesis 3.15, which talks about the having the power to crush the head of the serpent. And that is through Jesus Christ, of course, and then it's through his priesthood that is given where they are able to accomplish all of these things. So his church is being built out so that it can be administered and so that it can grow. And it grows very, very quickly. It's really very similar to what happened in the last days and with Joseph Smith. It was line upon line and precept upon precept, office upon office in the priesthood. These things happened in sequence and eventually started to build out the kingdom of God. Thank you.